I had this happen once where I got, couldn't get on Facebook, but I could get on, on YouTube easily. And I don't know if it's just that it gets so much traffic on Facebook that sometimes it just doesn't work. Mm. And I had, you know, since I was trying for so many minutes, we were waiting, 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 nothing. I, that to me is like, oh, something's not good, right? Mm. Okay, we are going live, folks, yep, on YouTube. And it's under my Katrina Radke channel, just so you know. Um, and I am going to re-record here on Zoom. We are recording on Zoom. So we have and Sorry. Okay, we're good. It's my fault that was up. <laughs> Should we mute ourselves? <laughs> yeah, so I'm going to go ahead and mute myself because I know Jack is going to take off here, okay? All right. right. Okay. Mm. We're live. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening for our first annual parenting summit. And Tonight we have four guests who will share their specialties in parenting, and uh, at the end we'll have a group discussion. So each person will be sharing for five to fifteen minutes about their um, their specialties. And oh, I'm Jackie Lamont. I'm your host, and <laughs> the tech expert is Katrina Radke. We, this would not have happened without her. <laughs> so. Um, Let's see. So this evening, we're going to start out with Tuomo, and I will let you say your last name. But I guess first I'll introduce you as Tuomo. And Tuomo is a coach and trainer for high achievers, helping them with a deeper sense of purpose and clarity. And he has traveled the world for 15, over 15 years, and lived in nine different countries. And he, um, while he's lived in those places. He's learned about their cultures, their habits, and their behavior models. And he's also a new dad. So we welcome Tuomo this evening to our summit. Thanks for being here, Tuomo. Thank you so much, Jackie. And uh, thank you for everyone else uh, who joined us for this, uh, this, this conversation. It's, uh, it's great to be here. So I'm very excited to share my, my knowledge and my sort of little expertise that I have from being a new parent. But uh, but yeah, let's, uh, uh, we are two months into my fatherhood and our parenthood right now. So it's been a very exciting and fulfilling journey so far. And I hope I can add, uh, add value and give my perspective for, uh, for everyone listening. Yes. All righty. Um, yeah, what an exciting time. And it sounds mm -hmm. like you've had so many different things go on in your life and now focusing on being a dad and, and that journey. So yes, quite exciting. So when, let's see, um, you've mentioned before that being a father, um, when you were raised by a single mother has mm -hmm. been, has given you a little bit of apprehension. Like, you know, am I, how am I going to know how to be a good dad when I didn't have a dad myself? Um, so how has that been for you? Um, yeah, it's, uh, where should I start? It's been it's been amazing. It's been interesting. It's been little ups and downs. And um, yeah, I'll just give you a little little quick backstory, if you will. Um, so, like like you mentioned, yeah, I grew up without the without the father, um, without the biological father uh, being being surrounded by him. He wasn't part of the picture at all, um, so to speak. Yet I did have uh, quote unquote father figures like my uncle. And my grandfather were there, but they were not present 24 hours a day, obviously, especially in the beginning. But I would say that I had, uh, quote unquote, father figures in my, in my childhood. Yet now, when we, a couple of years ago, when we started planning um, uh, to extend our family a little bit, obviously, these, these kind of little fears came up. Um, already a little lo longer time ago, but especially when we started the planning stages of, of, um, of having a baby uh, with my partner, all these, like I said, beliefs and fears started coming up like, oh, I'm, how am I going to be as a father? Because I, I didn't have a father myself. And then I was actually pushing back, um, um, pushing back on, on the actual, you know, becoming, becoming uh, a father and, and, and extending our family, if you will. So, I really had to kind of dig a little bit deeper and, and during the process a couple of years ago, I, I had established a connection with my father a little bit already, but a couple of years ago, I really had to actually, I, I went back home to Finland and I, I met up with him and we had a chat and conversation and I really 
I think what was one of the, the, the bigger things for me was that I really had to establish the connection and really establish the link with my father before actually accepting myself as becoming a father myself. That was, that was for me, that was a big thing. And then we had a couple of conversations and we kind of went for a lunch together and stuff like that. And, and the connection has never been amazingly strong, but I had to kind of bring it out to the table. Like, Hey, if, if I want to be a father, at least I want to strengthen that connection to my own biological father. And, and after that visit back home to Finland, as I'm living right now on the other side of the world, actually from Finland, it, it really, really helped me. Then I came back home and, and we started talking with my partner and, and, and really, it really relieved that pressure, if you will. So that was one of the, one of the bigger uh, sort of culmination points for me, for sure. And then, um, just reestablishing that connection to my sort of past wounds, if you will, or the past experiences, not necessarily wounds, but just um, the experiences that I had. So, so that was, that was a big, big part. And, um, and definitely right now, um, as, as the baby was born two months ago, it was, it was still actually another, uh, another big thing as the baby was born our son was born I still I had this like okay now I'm a father like now what almost like those ideas that you you absolutely must love your child unconditionally because that's what the society tells you and it was interesting to realize when the baby comes out of the womb and 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 it's it's there and it's like almost like thinking like do I have like where is that link I was kind of trying to mentalize it more and and kind of those stigmas of the of the society, kind of like you have to have that unconditional love. And and for me, it's been actually more about developing the connection. It's more about building that connection and making the link stronger instead of instead of having that connection right there and then. And um, I know from the female perspective, it's very different. And I we had a lot of discussions with my partner about it because. Uh, maybe somebody will share later, but the, the female, the mother's connection to the baby from the start, I believe, is very, very different to father's. And, 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 and that required more, more work, if you will, for, for, from my perspective, especially because I was like, okay, now I'm a father, now what? So um, that's what I kind of had to dig a little bit deeper and really spend conscious time um, um, with my son and just really establishing that connection and, and looking back into my past and, and, and making sure that all those links are either healed or reconnected or, or neutralized, if you will. So, so yeah, that's, uh, that's in a nutshell, the last, uh, last six months to, to a year in, in my life mm -hmm. about the fatherhood. Mm -hmm. Wow. So it sounds like you reconnecting with your father helped you to heal and yet you didn't feel like they were wounds but um yeah so reconnecting with him was quite important uh what what advice would you have for single moms who have the own their own worries about being able to raise their children without a dad is there anything you think for, that... for 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 my mom's perspective so i've i've actually stepped stepped into my mom's shoes a few times which is which is hard but especially um, my partner here, she has stepped into my mom's shoes a few times as well and just really realized uh, that how different it must be to, to raise a child, especially a newborn, uh, by yourself versus when you have a partner there with you, let alone grandparents and friends and things like that. So um, one of the biggest things that I've realized, for, again, from a from, from male perspective, um, that I'm not entirely sure how my mom was able to do that. Uh, and just for the reference, my mom actually passed away about a year ago. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that was also another, another kind of caveat into the, into the whole uh, coming, becoming a father and the parenthood. But, but what she was able to do as a single mother, um, and, and I was also growing up without brothers or sisters, so it was just me and, me and her. For one shape or form, she was able to she was able to feel me that she was able to, to, to build the environment that I never, ever felt that I lacked something. I never mm -hmm. felt that I lacked resources, that I lacked, lacked money, even if she was unemployed for, for two years in one point, me growing up for, for, for some way, okay. she was able to always feel 
make me feel secure. I think that was the biggest thing. No, no matter what the external environment was, no matter that, that, it, that like I said, in one point, we, uh, from now on, I can say that we were really struggling financially, but somehow she was able to make me feel secure. So I think that is the number one thing um, that the mother or father or parents, for that matter, and especially as a single mother that you can give to your, to your child is the sense of security, the sense of safety. Um, I believe that there's probably nothing else that comes above that. Um, so, so that would be the number one thing. No matter what happens ex externally, uh, make sure that, that, that your child, a newborn or an older one, feels the sense of safety, um, that, that it's a safe place to be and a safe place to grow up. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you have ideas of how, of how your mom did that with you? What, what were a couple things that made you feel secure? Um, again, uh, again, I could say like I, I grew up in Finland and I, I grew up in a very safe neighborhood already. And, and, uh, but at the same time, there were a lot of other parents that, and a lot, of, a lot of my friends that grew up in a, in the same environment that were raised differently. Uh, looking back, I think, I think the other thing that I never, ever remember that, that we would, we would have had a, a fight with my mom or that she would ever yell at me. Um, she obviously corrected me in her ways, but I never felt that, that she was too harsh on me. So I think the language that, first of all, the language that she was using was very positive and very encouraging. She helped me to overcome the obstacles and the sort of the, the situation that we had uh, in a very positive way. So, um, so that was one thing and, and definitely like I said, we like I, like my grandfather was there, my uncle was there. I was surrounded by a lot of other friends as well. So I felt like I had activities, and and obviously I you know I used to play a lot of sports back in, when I was growing up, like basketball, tennis, and football. And she was always making sure that I, I get to do what I wanted to do in, in sort of because I'm a very I was a very active boy. So as I would, when I when I wanted to do something, she she was like, okay, go out and be active and, 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 and do what you, what you want to do within the, the barriers and the sort of the borders that, that we had. So, so yeah, that's, that's from, from growing up from the child's perspective as well. <laughs> mm. That's great. That's, that's, those words are gold because there's mm. so many single moms who are so worried about being able to um, raise their children without a dad. Um, mm. You know, when I was divorced, uh, my sons were in grade school and I had those worries and I thought, gosh, are they going to be able to have strong marriages when they're grown up? Um, because they haven't gotten a great example um, mm. of, of a good marriage. And, uh, but yeah, so it's, it's really difficult for a single mom and that's amazing. You know, your mom sounds like she was an amazing person who, um, yeah, had the maturity and, and support, I'm sure, you know, support mm -hmm. from her family was helpful to her. So that's great. Yeah, okay. absolutely. And, and I just wanted to add one more thing there. I, I, I'm not entirely sure, but I believe that she purposely, um, we, we, we moved quite a few times in my childhood, like in the first six years, I think we moved about five times, um, mm -hmm. which on it in itself is probably the reason why I traveled the world for 15 years. <laughs> um, but the, the last place where we lived was, was kind of like very optimal place to grow up and that we were only two houses away from my grandfather. So I think she purposely made us to live in a, in a space where they had a lot of other children and my grandfather was there and, and, and the forest was, was right by and there was a lot of activities and things like that. I always, remember going out of the house and running into the forest. So, so yeah, so those, those things wow. definitely help a lot. Okay, that's great. So yes, it takes a village to raise a child and your mm -hmm. mom found her village with her family and, and a good neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, that's awesome. All righty. Well, another thing that, um, that you've sort of all of a sudden specialized in is, uh, helping your partner have a natural unmedicated birth, which can be rare and difficult, but doable. Um, mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit about that. 
how did you support her? And um, yeah, what, what was your purpose in, what was her purpose and your purpose in um, trying to do it naturally and unmedicated? And what do you feel was the um, outcome of it? How do you feel about it now? All right, so that's, uh, that's, let me just backtrack just a tiny bit. So I'm, I'm very much health conscious and health oriented. Health is, is one of my, uh, possibly one of the biggest values in my life generally. So I've, um, even, even before we were started planning uh, to have a baby, I already knew a lot about, about, about the birth and you know, how the birth happens and, and what are the, the benefits um, of having a natural birth. So, so we already started, even before um, my partner became pregnant, we, we already agreed that we'll try and we'll try to have it as natural as possible. So uh, leading up to the birth, she was actually really stepping up, stepping, stepping up on the plate and we were doing a lot of preparations uh, leading up to the birth, uh, as in like hypnotherapy, she was she was working with a private yoga teacher for nine months, pretty much the whole time of pregnancy. So we had a private yoga teacher coming to our house, um, which was really really helpful. Um, all the breathing exercises, um, uh, private practitioners, um, eating healthy, a lot of sort of mindfulness practices, um, dealing with the pain and and all these things. And we were reading a lot. She was probably I don't know how many books she's gone through. So we were going at going at it from the physical perspective, a lot of obviously from the mental perspective, as in reading and educating ourselves about it, and also from the emotional perspective about like how to deal on the first, first date about sort of the emotions that are coming up. And we talked a lot about the actual birth date and the delivery date and how we want it to happen. We made a, we made a birth plan um, that we gave it, to, gave it to the clinic beforehand so everybody there knew uh, how we want the birth to go through. And uh, we actually, the yoga teacher that we had at the house was also a, um, uh, a doula or the, the, what's it called again? The, um, ah, what's it, what's it called the again? Midwife? The, yes, exactly, the midwife. Okay. So she was a yoga therapist and the midwife. And mm. so she actually came, uh, we, we, she wasn't part of the clinic where we wanted to give the birth, but she actually came there as from as an external help, and she was in charge of the whole birthing process. So that was for me and for her was was a huge, huge help, um, uh, just from the trust perspective. And and we were able to we we knew exactly who are the people that we we're, we're going to be doing it with. So the preparation was absolutely key, um, and and like I said, we 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 accepted the birth plan for the clinic. So when when the, the contraction started and we started going to, towards the clinic, that's when um, uh, everybody knew that, okay, there's this couple coming that want to do a natural birth. And, and just for the reference here in French Polynesia, from the, from the mothers that are giving birth for the first time is only 2%, less than 2% um, are giving a natural birth. So the, the very common thing here is the epidurals, obviously. I think it's all around the world as well. But especially here, I would say about 80% of the mothers are, are getting an epidural. Yeah. And um, there's actually quite a few complications. There's probably more complications during the birth process, uh, minor or a little bit more than, than the natural birth. So there was a lot of these doubts that we had to deal. And actually, when we got to the clinic, there were some of the other midwives there that they they came during the contractions like oh would you like to have the epidural like why don't you why did you want to have it and all these things so we really had to be really set on our path and we exactly knew how we want it to happen and, and and what is our path and what is our protocols and 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 all that so so the reasons why we actually wanted to have it is, is obviously the health health reasons which I mean, there's there's a there's a huge list of health reasons why why it's better and um and one of the one of the, the main things for me from again from masculine or so the father's perspective um was that I, I i learned a lot about my partner uh during that 24 hour actually it was only about 12 less than 12 hours um i like i was able to see a different kind of 
person and personality of her. She almost transformed and into this into this. I don't know. I was like the local we call it Tahitian goddess, and there was like a different energy that she was able to harness. She was able to to work with the pain, because we did these all these preparations where we did the the hypnotherapy and the connection that she had with the baby in, in, in sort of the harshest parts of the of the 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 journey, if you will, when the contractions were the harshest. That was that was quite quite amazing to, to to see. And I was obviously there supporting her with all the, the planning and everything that we had. We had the breathing exercises and the massage protocols and there was a lot of things. So that was um it, it was definitely one of if if not the most powerful experience that I've ever had um, in my life. So, so I, I learned a lot. And, and, and obviously because of that and because everything that happened afterwards, our relationship has deepened even in a deeper level. And, 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 and my appreciation towards her as a female and as a mother and as a partner has, has, has gone into a very different level. So uh, just from that perspective alone, I think is, um, it's amazing to for fathers and for the for the, for the male partners to see the power of the true power of the of the feminine, uh, which which comes out during those natural birthing times. So so yeah, that's great. That's that's an awesome story, and that's amazing to think that where you are, eighty percent of all gals get epidurals. Um, mm -hmm. So you're surrounded by four mothers here. Um, I know I, I went natural both times, but my labors were not long. The first one was six hours. The other one was two hours, maybe. Um, so yeah, got it done quick. But, and I, so I don't know what would have happened if they would have been, you know, 12 or 24 hour labors. Um, but yeah, I was able to do it without any medication. Um, but yeah, and I know that, or I think that everybody else here is very, natural oriented so um yeah you certainly have our votes with um mm -hmm. with doing all that and it sounds like you covered all the bases in getting um prepared for it so mm -hmm. that's great yeah, well absolutely. um let's see well i think it's uh time now to turn to our next guest and um so thank you so much tomo for joining us thank this you. evening and being part absolutely. of this thank you so much <laughs> Um, and our next guest, guest is Anna Filly. And Anna is a teacher, a nurse, a life schooler, and a, she calls it natural mother of two. Um, and she helps, she helps women in their young, in their journey towards relaxing and calming parenting. So thank you so much for being here tonight, Anna. Thank and, you, Turkey. Yes. And so your specialty is natural parenting and maybe you know that's such um to me it's like an obvious sort of um term but yet it sounds like it's a very deep um deep subject so please tell us what what is natural parenting actually um natural parenting is how we are designed to be a mother or be a parent so it is and if you haven't heard about it, it is the other name of gentle parenting, conscious parenting, and attachment parenting. Mm -hmm. Gentle in a way that parents let their children reach their milestones in own pace. And for example, um, a baby should walk by age uh, or by nine months. Instead of, instead of letting him or her use walkers, just let him walk naturally so without the use of of this assistive this devices and conscious in a way that you are being mindful in every decisions or actions based on what is happening and not based on the opinion and not following the old traditional paradigm because here in the philippines before the newborn baby should wear a shear so that um, the healing of the umbilical cord is faster. But it should not be done because um, the baby 
can experience suffocation and attach in a way that um, the, import, the important factor is the co connection between the parents and the children to develop healthy and emotional state. Because right now, many children have um, emotional, uh, are healing from emotional state, right? And these three, for me, is the definition of natural par parenting in my experience. So it is gentle, it is conscious, and it is um, attached. So basically, natural parenting is centered on meeting your baby's, um, babies and children's needs. And parents, um, parents who meet and treat their babies with love and compassion and respecting and respect the children, they are wiring their, their children's brain for empathy, trust, and the ability to self-regulate stress. So, and here in the Philippines, my experience is that when you hold your baby too much, they said that you are ex spoiling them. For me, why not change that belief instead of saying that I am spoiling them, why not say that I am meeting my children's needs? See the difference? Spoiling versus meeting, which one is better? I think it's meeting your children's needs, right? Mm -hmm. So babies or children do not know how to self-soothe or, or, and if you let them crying or do nothing while they are crying, what are you doing to your children? So you are developing an insecure and dysfunctional little human and these babies are little humans. They're just little. They, they are humans, but they, they're just little. So that's basically the natural parenting for me, for my, um, in my experience, in our family's experience. Mm -hmm. Wow. And uh, yes, what I've been in school, it has been called attachment parenting is what I've learned about. And um, mm -hmm. Bowlby, I believe, is... Um, one of the main researchers that have talked about attachment parenting, and that is so important. And you're, you know, in the Philippines, that's not the only place where people say, oh, you're spoiling your child if you pick yes. them up. Um, it's, you know, widespread in America. And <laughs> um, mm -hmm. so, and there is quite the debate on it. Mm -hmm. And it seems like sometimes we swing one way, you know, to attachment, and then we swing the other way to, you know, you're spoiling them. Um, so it's so important for all of us who believe in natural parenting and, and being attached to always speak up for, for that, because it seems like, um, you know, the negative and the, yeah, I'll just call it negative is more, it's just easier, unfortunately, you know, it's not, but then the child does not learn attachment, does not learn empathy. And that is so important, um, so what are some practical ways that a, a mom or dad can, um, or other caregiver, can teach their children to, um, to um, regulate their emotions, to, um, to comfort and soothe themselves, and, and to have empathy? Do you have a few things that, um, just practical things, ways that you've used in the past with your kids? In my experience, um, my children, my first daughter, uh, my daughter who is four years old, she regulates her emotion through meditation. Just um, being quiet for one minute and I let her express what she's feeling. I'm not, I'm not the one that um, labeling her that she's angry or what. I let her express what, she's, what she is feeling and I just let her express it so that um, she will know, she will tell me what is the feeling, what is her emotion. Okay. So, you know, one of the um, main things that here in America we talk about is teach, teach your children emotion words. Um, so, so it sounds like your, um, your approach is sort of the opposite. 
that no just let them come up with whatever word they want to at that time mm -hmm. so okay yeah. very good mm -hmm. um something i've also thought about is um, and learned is that when a child is having a tantrum or you know just having having a really rough time mm -hmm. they learn how to comfort themselves by you comforting them yes. and so it sounds like um, that would probably be your approach um, as opposed to just sending a child into, you know, the corner or yeah, it's or very different. Or, yeah. So, so what do you, what do you do or what do you believe about like timeouts or, or spanking or yeah, things like that approach? Actually, I don't believe in spanking. Um, if my daughter is having tantrums, or meltdown, I just let her express her feelings and just let her go. And when she is calm, I'll, I'll talk to her after so that we can understand each other, what, what is going on to her, what is going on to, to me, what, what's the problem, things like that. So mm -hmm. that's our practices. And I also don't do spunking. I don't believe in spunking. Mm -hmm. um, instead, I use positive words to her and to my, to my son. So I think we should respond in love rather than reacting. Mm. Basically, me, um, of course, um, my emotions also are very high if she's doing that. But before I, I respond, I have to check myself if I am okay. Then if I am okay, I'll talk to her. Or if she's okay, I'll talk to her. Well, that is that is quite an interesting and, and important point. That yes, as, um, as the parent, you have to have your own emotions in check. And yes. you have to be okay before you're ready to respond instead of react, but respond yeah. to your child. Mm -hmm. So, um, gosh, what are some of the ways that you, you keep in an okay mode throughout the day? I mean, I know it's not, you know, nobody has a perfect, you know, wonderful day, but, um, but what are some, what are some tools that you use to, to help yourself just be in a, in a good peaceful mode so that you can respond instead of react? Actually, um, I wake up early at 3 a.m., here and do my miracle morning. Um, miracle morning is um, it has a mnemonics um save uh, savers. It means you you have to be quiet. So what I am doing is very different or or not arranged according to savers, but it's the same. It's like at first when I wake up, I have to affirm myself that I am good enough, I am good, and everything is okay. Then I'll do my yoga and breath work. And after that, um, I'll visualize the day and the goals that I want to create. After visualization, um, I write in my journal notebook. And also, I, I practice gratitude journaling so that um, so that my, 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 my emotions will look at the positive things and, and every details, especially our dog. Our dog is, um, such a noisy dog, but I appreciate her now. So I, I just, I'm just grateful that we have a dog and she's working. That's what I am saying. It's mm -hmm. the, no, you're you're quite, you're noisy. I don't things like that. So I just r write it in my journal. Then um, intuitive. Um, I'm owning my intuition and the shadow work. I'm doing shadow work a lot. And also, I read at least one book. Before I used to read two books, but no, it, it can't be like that. So um, I I I read at least one book and. That's it. That makes me peaceful. That makes me calm. And if 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 I have to react, I have to check my first my check. I have to check my myself first. 
Wow. Okay, so at the end of your long list of everything that you do before the children get up, you said, that's all. Okay, <laughs> that's, that's amazing. Wow, you know, people talk about morning meditations or, or morning routines and holy cow, that's, that's amazing. So no wonder you're so peaceful. That's awesome. Ah, thank you, thank you. <laughs> so yeah, and your kids really benefit from that. And you're yes, also, you, you're, you're a great example to them, I'm sure. So yes, yeah. actually they're doing yoga also. Their favorite, their their favorite pose is the dog pose and the tabletop. Okay. Um, I, I'm just amazed that they're doing that without teaching them. So wow. yes, um, children are a great imitator. So we have to be careful with our language, with our with our actions. They silently observe what we are doing they sure do right right for better or for worse yes so <laughs> yes <laughs> wow um gosh thank you so much for sharing all those um ideas yeah. and let's see um yeah i have more questions but i'm gonna all i'm right. gonna save them um because we'll move along but all right yes thank you so much for sharing all those ideas yes thank um, you Jackie. Yes. So next we will move along to Katrina, Katrina Radke. And she is an Olympian and a sports psychology professor and a therapist who specializes in helping achievers stress less and maximize their success and happiness at the same time. So thank you for being with us this evening. And you're doing a great job. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> All of you are too. This is, this is so fun. <laughs> Um, and, you know, I did share earlier that, okay, so when I was a kid for like probably three or four years from six to nine or so, I was on a swim team. And I remember standing on the blocks, you know, thinking, okay, there were no female role models at that moment for swimming um, in the Olympics. I, nobody that I remembered. But yeah, just standing on those blocks thinking, okay, here's the Olympic, you know, gold medalist <laughs> about to get in. So that is so awesome that at at that early age, like you were about nine or 10, I think, when, when you've said that you talked with your parents and you said, I wanna be an Olympic swimmer. And so they helped you problem solve and plan and you fulfilled your dream. And so- I was very lucky, very fortunate. Yes, that's awesome. Right, and I was thinking you grew up in Minnesota. Mm, I'm thinking you did a lot of indoor swimming, not outdoor. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Oh. Too much snow here. <laughs> I'm thinking, yes. So um, let's see. So one of the ways or one of the things that I'd like to ask you about, um, since we're on a parenting summit tonight, is when, well, let's see. Yes. How, what was it like to, to have those goals as a child? Um, and what did your, how did your parents help you? How did they help you? Um, and how can parents nowadays help their teens, especially when they're athletes and they're having trouble, you know, staying focused on their goals? Yeah. So, so, you know, not everybody at a young age has such deep desires. And I think it was a weird because when I was in third grade, we had a writing assignment that said, when I am 25, dot, 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 and we were supposed to complete the sentence in cursive, we were learning our cursive writing. And I wrote, when I am 25, I will have gone to the Olympics, won many medals in swimming, then get a boyfriend, coach for a couple of years, and then get married. <laughs> <laughs> and it's really funny because um, I found this in a scrapbook that my mom had created many years later. And it was just like, wow, like I didn't know I had that idea at that age. And I think some children come into this world really having a really good vision of what they want to do. And I remember when I read this around my early 20s going, gosh, I need to create this for when I'm 50 and when I'm 75, right? Because sometimes um, I was so goal focused on what I wanted. And yet I wasn't detailed in thinking about how I was going to make it happen. I just knew I wanted it to make it happen. And luckily, my parents supported me in my dream and allowed me to be able to pursue it. Um, and which some parents get fearful, right? We all sometimes get nervous, like what if they can't do it? Or what if, what if X, Y, or Z happens even if they're successful? Or, right, there's all these possibilities that could go 
wrong, um, even if you are successful. So um, I was fortunate in that I never really thought about all that. I was just thrown into like, hey, I'll try this and see what happens. And thankfully, I grew up in such a town that I didn't know that I may not be so good if I was living in suburbia, for example. Um, as a parent, watching my two children, I have a 14-year-old daughter and a 13-year-old son who just turned 13 last weekend, actually. He's now a teen. Um, it's very interesting because we're more in the cusp of Minneapolis, Minnesota area on the you know, suburban area. And you could see where some children do get lost when they're in a bigger environment, thinking they aren't very good at something that they may really love. And sometimes we really tell a lot of parents, for example, just tell a real quick story. We had a client who was uh, like a 10 year old basically told to quit his sport because he wasn't good enough. Mm -hmm. And we said, no, you can do this. And we you know, gave him things and we gave him tools and he followed through and really wanted to go for it. And uh, interestingly, by his senior year in high school, he was in the state finals for his sport. And imagine if he had quit at age 10, 11, 12, right? Mm -hmm. And it happens to a lot of us because as parents, it's very easy for us to have our own fears and limits get placed on our children. And I know I have not been perfect. I'm doing the best I can with what I know, but I also let my kids know that I'm not perfect. And I think so often, um, I really, you know, a lot of times people ask me, oh, do your kids swim? And I say, well, they can swim, but they don't care to become competitive swimmers. Mm -hmm. And it's, I really am a firm believer that it's very important for our children to find what they love to do and for us parents, for us to support them in what they love to do. And sometimes we have our own ideas of what that might look like. And then we have to put our ideas aside and remind ourselves that this is their path and we need to let them feel like they're in charge because that's where they're gonna thrive versus if we try to make it happen for our needs, they eventually will rebel or, or not feel very good about themselves because of that. And so I think that's one of the biggest things that we really try to do when working with, you know, I work with a lot of athletes as well as, you know, teenagers in general, as, as well as parents, many business people in, um, gosh, you know, as parents, if we haven't done our own personal growth work, it's so easy to dump our stuff onto kids. And because they're like an automatic dependent who needs our love and support. And so if we're feeling we haven't taken care of our own needs, we may try to get them met through somebody else who's dependent on us. And so it's a big piece that I really encourage with parents is, okay, you may be saying this about Johnny or Susie, your child, but what's really going on for you that you have these judgments or fears or worries or other things that are triggering this in yourself to be worried about your child. And of course, sometimes as children are growing up and there's so many environmental things or social things going on with the social media, that could be a whole nother conversation for another day. But um, I loved, you know, what Anna said is like the more as if the parent stays grounded in touch with who they are, the child will feel that. And as uh, more as parents, we go through our own stuff. The parents, the kids feel that too. And um, I've learned for myself, you know, obviously being a therapist and a coach, I work with a lot of people, but as a human being, as a mother, I also say, you know what? I know I'm not perfect and I'm not doing everything exactly how I may have wanted, let's say, but I'm doing a lot of things very well. I also go, you know what? My child is going to be okay, number one, and that they have their own path to forge and from there, um, even if I really screw up or do amazingly well, they have their path set for them in many ways. I've, I'm a firm believer in that. Everybody has their own views on that, but I'm a believer that they come into this world. There's certain things that are going to be create. They're going to create for themselves, regardless. Mm -hmm. And um, we can get the whole nature nurture debate on that stuff, but it is fascinating. And so I have literally learned to just sit back and love them for who they are. And it's amazing as you go through the stages because they keep changing. And, you know, um, you know, some of us who are in baby phase versus teenagers versus adult phase, I see even with myself, I'm going to be turning 50 this year. And I look at even my relationship with my own mother and my father, how that changes over time um, based on my own progression, if you will. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that really answers your question, but. Yeah. And then some, yeah, <laughs> that's amazing. I felt like saying amen so many times yeah. with yeah your statements, because yes, kids are going to be their own people. And if we don't, you know, have our own selves, if we're not okay, like Anna was referring to, and um, yeah, if we're trying to still heal or nurse our own wounds, then we're not going to be present in the right way for our kids. And we're going to put things off onto them 
expectations and such. Yes. That, that For those of you listening to this, maybe later, it could be a year later or whatever, know that it's okay not to be perfect. You know, I was listening to something, I don't even remember what it was in the last few days, somebody talking about they had an abusive father and they learned to go back and forgive the father. And the father, and actually the father came to the child and said, can you please forgive me? I know I was abusive. I know I was X, Y, and Z. And the child was able to forgive. And it was a healing thing for both of them, right? The dad knew he wasn't perfect. He had been abusive and other things that happened, but he was actually acknowledging it. So even that's a teaching moment for all of us, right? To actually take ownership and responsibility for, wow, I am a human being. I may have hurt you and I'm really sorry. And, and can, can you please forgive me? And can I forgive myself too, right? So often all of us can carry stuff for a long time with us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Yes. And I, I have a premise that um, you have to heal yourself before you can really help heal your child. We, yeah. <laughs> I'll That's just why leave we're it all that. connected, right? Because we're all into this personal growth and finding out who are we really and how can we maximize who we are mm -hmm. and help right. other people do it. Right. Yes. Yeah. And something else that I've um, really keyed in on is that, you know, moms need to remember their strengths. Dads need to remember their strengths because, you know, like you said, because um, I think we all have these um, societal expectations put on us that, mm -hmm. oh, you got to keep up with everybody. Everybody's got to be clean. Laundry's got to be done. Everybody has home cooked meals every night. Well, no. And that's not, it's okay to slip up and stuff. Um, so yeah, we don't have to be perfect. So that's awesome. Um, so what are some of the ways that, that you help teens? And um, yeah, and maybe like in goal setting, how do you, how do you coach the, the teens? And- um, Very good question. So it's very interesting because, um, you know, I grew up, I'm very, definitely an intense type A in many ways. And you know, I have a side of me that's also very caring and nurturing and working with teens. I tell them, look, I used to train very, very hard. I value you know, dedication. I value being disciplined in something. And yet with that being said, I have found, especially nowadays with all the social media and people having their own phones, um, gosh, these poor kids. I mean, I feel for them because they, instead of going home and having their own quiet space, um, you know, a whole other world can go on by the time the morning comes um with uh school like they could be in school and come home and instead of having quiet time in your own space you know if you weren't on the texting or on the stuff you may have felt like you missed out on this whole reality that happened via social media and um which i think is, is a difficult struggle for teenagers i know some of the people that we've worked with because they don't know it's okay to turn off their phone or tell people sorry i'm done uh the boundaries of no um those kinds of things yeah. so a lot of what I teach and stress to a lot of the, ch the teenagers that I work with is the importance of trusting themselves, trusting their inner voice, listening to that inner voice. And so we do a lot of actual meditation and visualization. And it's funny because we may have some macho teenage athletes come in, especially some males, right? And um, they can melt and open up their hearts too. And they just go, wow. And so they think they're coming mm -hmm. to us for one thing for let's say peak performance and they leave and they keep coming to us because they realize, wow, I'm feeling better about myself. I'm really getting in touch more with who I am. I'm, I'm learning to listen and get quieter and slow things down. And ironically, when we go to that place, we actually can get things done much more quickly, right? Uh, yeah, so there's a, it's a very interesting balance, but I think the biggest thing I see working with teens, and some of you can probably relate to this, is there's a lot more anxiety, I feel like, than 20 years ago. And um, they're not knowing how to release the anxiety, which then of course can turn into other issues. Um, and nowadays too, because medications are such a big deal in the society um, that a lot of them think it's important to go get medication. And that's not always the answer. So um, I really encourage the kids to get quiet and do deep breathing, doing even just stretching and just learning to get that quiet space to then, um, and we do a lot of journal writing, we do goal setting. So within the goal setting, just real quickly, and I know we also wanna get going to other people here, is um, I love to have people imagine, I have a book that's called Be Your Best Without the Stress, and I share some tools in there that I use actually for my sports psychology college students. And it's really to help pe people truly go back home to their true self. But before they even understand that concept is if you had a magic wand and you were guaranteed every wish and you could be, 
whoever you want to be and do whatever you wanted to do and have whatever you wanted to have. And you had no fears and was guaranteed. What would you create for your life? And then writing nonstop. I'm sure some of you've done this exercise where you write nonstop for a few minutes and just let everything come out and nothing's too silly. Just keep writing and then do it again a couple of days later. Cause usually your mind starts opening up to other possibilities. And then what happens is you go, Whoa. And then we have them circle the top three things and then maybe put some deadlines on it or ideal deadlines. And then action steps, simple ones that can start now to take steps up to the top of the mountaintop. And having people, some people are just so afraid to set goals or even dream big because they think they can't have those things. Or, or so often somebody will say to me, oh, I'm not even thinking about Olympics, but I'm hoping to get like a, you know, maybe get a certain time to get to a certain meet that's maybe at a state, you know, state or lower level, right? Local level. And um, I've really learned to appreciate that not all of us have talent in the physical area, let's just say. And um, some people are very, very lucky to get to a state level. And that's an amazing accomplishment. And to really celebrate that or celebrate whatever level you do get to making it maybe some making a varsity team or being able to be on the JV team and actually compete or whatever it is, is knowing that you actually went for something and you can still have the same fulfillment no matter what level you reach. And I think that's very important. Our society gets so caught up in these titles and rankings and medals and you know what that means. And then people don't feel good enough about themselves. And I think a biggest issue we have in society is that people are feeling like, I'm not enough, I'm not enough. And um, really they need to know I matter. I can make a difference. I can learn and grow and contribute. And um, that I'm loved, you know, I can love myself. I can love others and feel okay with that. that and so it's a big lesson that we really teach beyond going after your dreams is knowing that you can be okay regardless of what level you get to in whatever that might be. Um, and to know that you're contributing in your own way. Like one of my main favorite people that um, did not get to travel in college days for, for competition with us um, because we had so many people on the team that were really amazing. Um, but she was my main training partner. She was the best gift to the whole team because of the way she vibrated another level of energy and getting everybody to rise to what's possible. And she brought, she brought the most, she got the most out of her talent that she possibly could get. And when you're helping other people do that, that's way more valuable than what your times are or what places you get or what title you get in a job one day or how much money you make. And when people can tap into that and start going, hey, what do I really love? What fulfills me? What, what do I want to spend my time doing? And then I, how can I immerse myself in that and get support in doing that? Then you're living, right? Wow, yes. Yeah, you just said it all. <laughs> yeah, because it it's so important to be fulfilled. But yes, we're, um, we're often going towards everything else. Yes. Not, not the internal fulfillment, but the external rewards and, and what people expect of us. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Wow. So I just, you know, real quickly, I'll just share. Um, so my subtitle of my book is It's Not About the Medal. And in the 1980 mm -hmm. Olympics, um, I spent in 88, and the East Germans were first and second. As you know, a lot of them were on steroids, not by their choice, but by the government and the doctors mm -hmm. in East Germany at the time. And so I, I, I was fifth place in my event. And I might get a bronze medal one day because they actually go through this whole legal system. They know that they were on drugs, all of this stuff. And it's just so interesting because what would that bronze medal give me? Nothing. It's just a medal, truly. Mm -hmm. And it sounds funny, but we get so attached and we think, I think what happens, and I'm thankful at age 17, I had this experience. So I think many people go their whole life to 60, 70, 80 years old, whatever it is, striving for something. And then they actually receive it and they go, but this is all there is. Mm -hmm. And they thought that they were going to all of a sudden change who they are or feel how they, you know, change how they feel internally. And no, that's still with you. You get to, that's part of the whole gift of the whole life is you get to work through that your whole life. Right. Yeah. Right. It's all about identity. Yeah. Your inner identity. Are all the things we all have moments of all different kinds of feelings and to integrate them and honor all of them is I think when we're living fully. Right. Mm hmm. Yeah. Wow. Thank you for sharing all that. Yeah. That's. Wow. You know, there's so much wisdom on this screen. <laughs> I love this. I'm taking notes from everybody. So yeah. Thank you for we sharing. That. Yes. <laughs> Good. Yes. So um, let's see. So our last uh, guest this evening is Caroline Benedum, and she her own specialty is homeschooling. And um, well, I'll let her kind of expand on on your other <laughs> on Endeavors. specialties and such. Yes, yes. <laughs> so. um, well, first of all, I want to thank you for putting this together. I uh, it's amazing that you can throw five people together and they have so much in common. 
I have a lot in common with um, Tomo and uh, with everyone here. (laughs) Yes, yes. Thanks for being here. And um, yes, homeschooling is is one of the hats that I wear. I have a lot of hats, (laughs) Mm -hmm. but we've been homeschooling for 10 years. It wasn't um, my first choice, and I never even thought of doing that. I I come from a corporate background. Um, I found myself uh, pregnant at 43 and we were not expecting that. My oldest daughter at the time, uh, she was already 25 or 24, 24 or 25. I can't remember now, (laughs) but yeah, we were empty nesters and I was just working. We were living in, in the Silicon Valley and both my husband and I were just, you know, doing our thing. And then we find out that we're having a baby and really late in life. Mm -hmm. And We already, you know, married off our daughter and (laughs) we're starting all over again. Yes. And so that was a shock to the system, no doubt. And I was kind of in a denial state for quite some time. And my husband just wanted to celebrate every day. And I'm like, this cannot be happening. (laughs) But it was. And it was such a blessing. And I... when she arrived, I was woefully ill-prepared because I, I wasn't thinking like a mother at that time. I was a person that worked and had a, a career. And so uh, it really threw a wrench in my mindset. And I think um, when you're trying to have a baby, like Tuoma was describing, you do all those preparations uh, for your mind and body and, you know, you, you set some plans in place and you're awaiting this, you know, bundle of joy. And for us, it was quite the opposite. It was a shock in how are we going to do this at this, at our age? And am I going to go back to work? And are we going to have to have higher a nanny and all of those things? And uh, after she was born, I decided, no, I'm not going to have someone else raise her. Not like I did with my first one. I, I worked all the way through my pregnancy with the first, my first child. And I worked, you know, shortly afterwards and I continued working. So I really didn't spend as much time with her as I, I really wanted the first one. So this time around, I thought, no, this is, she's a gift. And um, I'm not going to go back to work. And living in Silicon Valley, you you have to have like three jobs, <laughs> you know, uh, just the sheer expensive uh, or the cost of living is so high there. But um, I made that decision. I said, I can't. I, I don't want to miss out on this joy. So we decided to move when she was about two and um, moved to where his family lives in Ohio. And um, I never intended to homeschool, but where we lived, the schools were not up to par and we checked it out, went to a board meeting and everything was about lack. We don't have enough money for this. We don't have that. We need to make cuts. And I asked my husband, why would we send her to a place that, you know, uh, couldn't provide any of the wonderful things that school should, you know, provide. Let's, let's think about this. And then just through the journey, I uh, had a friend recommend homeschooling and I thought, Oh no, 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 no. <laughs> we are not doing that. I, you know, but I didn't realize that I've been, um, I've been teaching kids all along anyways in different capacities why couldn't I do this? And so all of the fears started stripping away. And uh, through the help of a friend, we decided to kind of do this together, partner up. And if we messed up for kindergarten, we have first grade, (laughs) we can send them back to school. (laughs) So we are, we started in kindergarten and it, and it went really well. I was surprised. She was um, just blossoming and enjoyed learning and look forward to it every day. And so do what, so did I, you know, very secretly, I was like, I couldn't wait to get up in the morning to, to work with her and to discover things and go places and, and have these conversations, 
you know, that are just amazing if you take the time to have a conversation with your child um, in a calm way about wonderful things, creative things, you're going to have an amazing uh, relationship. And so I said, okay, so we can do first grade. I think I can do first grade. That went really well. Second grade, great, wonderful. Third grade, oh, everything went down the toilet. Oh, <laughs> yeah, oh dear. it did. Uh, I had set some expectations for myself and changed things around and dedicated a room for schooling. And, and I think I was trying to um, mimic what public schooling was for home. And I, I, all of a sudden I felt like I had to step it up and, and be more rigid. And that wasn't, that's the wrong thing to do <laughs> for us. And I made mistakes and um, I learned very quickly that children aren't vessels that we just pour information into and expect it to come out the other side perfectly. That's just not what it is. We want to cultivate the desire for learning. We want to light the fire to be lifelong learners. We don't want to jam information into our children. And I, I, it took you know, a full year after that to realize, I come to the realization that I kind of um, decided you know, to be more rigid for some reason. I don't know, I thought that was what you're supposed to do in third grade. <laughs> And I think it was my own fear that what if she fell behind? Well, there is no falling behind. I didn't realize at that time. She's 15 now. She's just finished up her high school, our first year in high school. And we're still homeschooling. Uh, we do it differently. Um, but we all work at home together. She's doing her schoolwork and I'm, I'm working on my other endeavors. And so, and that allows me some free time too. And she's a very, very motivated person. She has a couple of businesses. She plays instruments. I mean, she's very self um, propelling, I guess how you, how you would say that. And I'm so mm -hmm. grateful for that because it allows me to, to, um, to pursue some other things, some exciting things. And like Anna, what you were saying about um, your parenting style, I'm learning about that now because I want to expand my business into conscious parenting coaching because I truly, truly believe in what you're doing. And that um, Tomo, I was also uh, brought up by a single mom, but her uh, style of parenting was quite the opposite. <laughs> she was more like, oh, I'm going to work, uh, I'm just going to leave you somewhere. And, you know, she didn't really uh, give a whole lot of thought or time into parenting. So I found myself uh, lacking direction and, and guidance and, and things like that. And I just made a promise to myself when I was younger that if I were to become a parent, that I would definitely learn from these things and never repeat them and to make sure that my child did feel safe and comfortable and loved and that there's no worry, you know, while they're growing up. And I was able to do that. But um, I think the most important thing uh, as far as uh, Katrina, you were talking about teens too, is um, if you're not with your child enough, I think, in the younger years, or you don't have a good relationship at all, just start showing up in their teenage years too, when they're, they start to, to act out a little bit and do things that are risky and, um, you know, things that are not quite as healthy for them. And because they, they're, if a child doesn't grow up with that love and the security, I think they will go find it in any way or soothe themselves or heal, try heal those wounds and things like that. And, um, and my experience has just driven me to pursue coaching for kids. And that's what I do. I, I coach kids um, on a variety of topics. So if they're dealing with um, issues with not 
being able to tell the truth or um, they're very shy and they can't say anything or they don't feel like they have a voice. I mean, just I have 27 lessons that, that I have, but any of, any of those things that don't require therapy, I can coach them through. And I found that parents are needing a little bit of coaching as well, because if I'm working with a child and, and we're getting a headway and they go home to the same environment, sometimes it negates everything that we've, that we've worked on. And so I've decided to go ahead and pursue um, conscious parenting coaching. And um, I should be finished in December uh, along with life coaching and to couple everything all together, work with the parents and with the child and so that they can live in harmony and, you know, just reach their potential uh, for both parties, for both the parent and the child. And we're all under construction. It doesn't matter how old you are, or if you're an old parent or a young parent, <laughs> you're, you're still learning. Mm -hmm. and there's still always new things to learn. And um, I'm, just, I'm just really thankful to be in this business. And I'm thankful to be here tonight. I've learned so much. Oh my gosh, this has been wonderful. <laughs> Hasn't it? <laughs> yes. Well, I'm so glad you're a part of this too. Um, yeah. You know, there's so much, uh, you know, you're, so you said that your daughter is very um, self-propelled and mm -hmm. in homeschooling, you have to be, and as the parent, you have to be self-propelled because you're, you're definitely, you know, guiding the child and you've got to follow certain, well, I don't know, maybe you don't have certain deadlines, but, you know, I suppose there's testing that they have to meet um, so that, you know, to prove to the state or whatever that they've passed their, their courses. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, you've, you've really taught her how to be self-propelled by doing what you've been doing. Yeah, so. She's, she's amazing. She's just been a wonderful to be around with and not every parent is cut out for this. I'll have to say, I didn't think I was, I just, uh, just went moment by moment. And I saw the, the light bulb go off in her eyes when we talk about historic things. And I thought, Oh, she likes history. So do I. I mean, <laughs> so little things like that, little wins, like, Oh, she got all of her spelling words. Correct. And, you know, as and, and I can, go to bed at night saying, you know, I, I taught her to read. I, I taught her how to do multiplication that came, that came from home. And um, we since move and we moved to an area that the schools are just perfect. And, um, but we decided to just continue on uh, at the advice of a teacher, actually, when we were doing testing, she said, Nope, just keep on doing what you're doing. Don't even worry about it. And so it's like, Oh, okay. I got a little bit of validation. <laughs> so Tuomo, I love your country, Finland. I went there a year and a half ago and I visited the Finnish schools to understand how they how they <laughs> teach and why their scores are so high on the PISA uh, yeah. testing. You know, I and it was very impressive and I've I learned a lot and I love that country and uh, there's a lot you can learn from Finland about raising children. First of all, the biggest shocking shocker thing that I saw is uh, children were playing in the streets yeah. of Helsinki without parental <laughs> guide. I mean, there was no parent around and we were all shocked being an American. It's like, oh my gosh, where are their parents? No, they were perfectly fine. And they went shopping on their own. They were very independent. And um, Boy, that was uh, that left mm. an impression on me. Is that you can teach your children uh, yeah. to be independent yeah. and safe at the same time, yeah. and yeah. it does really well for their self-esteem and their confidence levels. That we don't need to be hovering over our children all the time, um, and it's very healthy. So I really appreciate your country, Tuomo. I'm sorry I got off track. <laughs> yeah. That's okay. Um, and my computer is letting me know that I have to plug in. So I'm going to my kitchen. You get to see my kitchen. <laughs> oh dear. Jack, you are so thankful for you creating this all for uh, all of us tonight. And I just oh. there's so many things that everybody could share. All of these could be hours worth of, 
you know, content oh, basically. Definitely. Yes. Yes. Well, I'm so glad everybody took the plunge with me to, to actually do this. Um, you want us to can I, can I interview you or do you rather do that another time? Um, you can ask a few questions, but okay. I got to find my plug here. Okay, so, so Jackie okay. has shared with me a little bit about how um, she's worked with people with ADHD and that you have a program. Who's your program for? And could you share some aspects of it? Yes, um, so my program is mostly for moms. Um, it'll probably specialize with single moms, but any mom who um, wants to be at her best, but feels like she has trouble doing that. Mm. Um, and I think, you know, conscious attachment parenting will be part of that. Um, I have a list of um, different areas of what I call family health to help a, the whole family to be healthy. Um, so it's a very holistic program. And um, yes, I, when I was a younger mom, um, I realized that there were a lot of things that were missing from me. Um, I didn't have, I had some support, but not as much as I could have used. And I could have used a mentor. And um, my mom, I didn't want to follow her example um, in raising me. And so um, I had I had enough difficulties. I've I have ADD, I've struggled with depression. Um, and those are both much better nowadays because of how I what I do to treat them and manage them. But at the time it was really difficult and you know, when you put your children in timeout and you come back a minute later and say, why are you guys sitting there? They're like, mom, you put us in timeout. Oh yeah. Um, you know, they didn't have clean socks. Um, you know, I forgot to send permission slips with them. So they'd miss the field trip. So there were lots of things that I just was not on top of stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, I felt like I, I didn't just, in some ways I was a great mom. I'm really good at playing with my kids. Um, I'm very creative. And on the other hand, sometimes I felt like I yelled too much. So those were the moms that I can relate to the best. And um, so I've got a lot of experience, but I've also got wisdom through um, getting my degrees and teaching with a parenting program. Um, and so I've been working with families for about 19 years now and coaching moms. Uh, you know, it's called skills training when you do it with a, a mental health center. Um, so I've been doing skills training with families, you know, the kids, the moms and dads, and then the families as a whole. And uh, so my first program will be for the parents, especially the moms, um, in using the different keys to family health. And then I also want to develop a program for families, family activities um, for everybody to work together. So, um, and the, the different things, the different parts of, um, family health that I think are the most important are, let's see, well, first of all, the relationships, like the attachment parenting, um, conscious parenting, you have to be able to empathize with your child instead of thinking, you know, what's wrong with you? Um, you know, that's, that's not a good question. The question is, what's going on? What's going on inside of you? Um, how can I help you to get through this? Um, so communication, I enjoy teaching families communication skills. I messages are are so simple um, and so necessary, but sometimes, yeah, so few people use them. So um, let's see, yeah, conflict resolution. Uh, that's so important, and it's it's so simple to teach children things, and they get it, and you model it to them, and they really they understand, and they can change. And so like you were saying, Caroline, you need to, um, let's see, you've got to help the parents also um, because if you only teach the child and they go back to the home, then um, they're really at a disadvantage. So, and sometimes they do end up teaching the parents mm -hmm. um, the conflict resolution. Um, and I teach kids how to deescalate their parents because that's quite, quite useful. Um, and then there's, you know, a big chunk of it is about discipline. And so Anna's showing us who, oh, you've got your children there. <laughs> Hi guys. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so discipline is a big part of it, but 
if you have already developed the relationship with your child and you've got good communication and conflict resolution skills, then the discipline goes so much more smoothly. Um, and let's see, and then there's the physical um, health part of it. So I concentrate on nutrition and exercise, sleep. Nobody sleeps enough um, and everything's worse without enough sleep and self-care. Um, and, you know, as Dean Graciosi says, you, you sell people what they want, but you give them what they need. Mm -hmm. So in this program, I'm going to sell moms the, you know, the program to have well-disciplined kids and, and to manage their homes. But in the meantime, I'm also going to be teaching them self-care and healing of their own wounds, um, like we've been talking about. So, um, so self-care is so important. And they can teach their kids self-care also. I'll talk about root issues of like ADHD and different mental health issues. Um, some of the root issues that I find are the most important are allergies um, that can really mess with the brain and the emotions, um, vision problems, working memory, uh, not having enough exercise and the sleep issues, um, and just a, a basic healthy diet can be so helpful. Um, and then we'll talk about routines and goals. Uh, the more I'm in this business, the more I realize that goals are just imperative to have mental health. And if you have goals, so much, so many of the other things just kind of fall to the wayside. They're not, the, the mountains are not mountains anymore. They're just molehills because you feel empowered and capable of, um, of managing things and going towards your goals. So, um, Let's see, and then breaking those down into like routines and habits. Um, so yeah, that's- all that sounds different. so good. One thing you also had mentioned, um, I'm just curious, what are ways that you, some other ways, maybe some one or two tips you do to connect with children? Well, I, you know, I think Anna, <laughs> Anna actually um, covered a lot of those. Um, but yes, you know, having the relationship with your child first and such that, well, I think I've mentioned that um, if your child is having a meltdown, they have to be taught how to self-soothe by you soothing them. They can't do it on their own. You can't expect them to do that. And so holding them, you know, talking to them gently, giving them a teddy bear. Um, so those are, those are ways to, to help your child um, learn, yeah, learn how to to help themselves and how to connect with them. And also letting the child lead. Um, it can be fun to have just a few minutes even of a day to, you know, where you let your child be the leader. Okay, what are we gonna do for the next 15 mm -hmm. minutes? And when you're playing with them, follow their lead. Um, have a game of, of building blocks together and you have to um, do the same thing with your blocks that they do with their blocks. That makes them feel important and builds their leadership skills and also um, really is a bonding time. And there is um, a practice called shared attention. Shared attention is when you both are focusing on the same thing. Mm -hmm. And at that time you're bonding. So even if it's as passive as watching a movie together, that's bonding. If you're cooking together, doing homework together, you're bonding. So whenever you're sharing attention with your child, they're, they're feeling valued and special and um, so that's that's great for attachment and empathizing with them. That's great. I love all that stuff you're sharing. It's uh, so powerful. Um, all everybody that tonight tonight has shared some wonderful tips for people who want to listen to this later. And gosh, I feel like we could do a few rounds of this. <laughs> I do too. Yes, I so value and appreciate everybody's input tonight. Yeah, thank you, Jackie, for organizing this. Yes, yes. I have to share um, a book that I just started reading, but it just blew my mind. And it's called Unconditional Parenting by Alfie Kahn. Kahn. It is hmm. an amazing book and it talks everything what you're talking about, Anna, and more. And I wish I had read this a long time ago. It is the best book on parenting that I have read so far. And um, it's like, really emphasizing nonviolent parenting, uh, not, not physically, but also uh -huh. verbally. Um, 
and even with your body language. And it's, it's just, I had to share that. Mm. Wow. Well, and maybe we could each share our favorite parenting book if we have one. Mine is Making Children Mind Without Losing Yours by Dr. Kevin Lehman. I like that. <laughs> yes, yes. Making Children Mind Without Losing Yours. Oh, interesting. Nice yes. title. Yes, yes. Because <laughs> it kind of grabs those of us who are control freaks, um, but he teaches authoritative parenting, not, mm. not authoritarian, not passive, but authoritative letting the kids know what the rules are and teaching them how to follow them and how discipline actually means to teach. So, yeah, that's my favorite. Anybody else have favorites to share? Um, I guess I can share something. I actually, uh, I don't have a necessarily a book, but I have a, a, a sentence or insight or a mindset shift that probably was the, the, the deepest and the best that I've, had for in my, in my whole journey like basically i'm i was recommended with a lot of books and i i read i'm an avid reader i read a lot of personal development books and and i, I started reading few of the, the parenting especially the fatherhood books and, and i just i don't know for some reason i it, it was hard for me to read about parenting especially when i was so sort of and especially right now like coming into it and 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 everybody everybody was telling me like, oh, you should do this and that you should do that. And like, there's so much information coming, especially as a new father. And, you know, when we were expecting the, the son to come to this world. So everybody was like giving their best advices, which is great. And then I just kind of got confused. And like, then, then I read from some, actually two pieces of advice that I've had. Um, first one was I read from somewhere, actually it was a kind of the men's master, mastermind circle that I was, remotely part of and somebody shared over there and said like hey as, as a first time father like you've been you've been told so much information you've been told so many advices just forget everything well not forget everything but the best advice that i received was that your son will teach you everything that you need to know it's so true <laughs> <laughs> your, your son or your child will teach you what you need to know and instead of me trying to teach them what if we what if we start observing what if we just kind of like sit back and it's like okay what can i teach what what can i, I learn here and what can we learn together because because especially in the beginning I, i'm realizing that is that we are just responding to the child's or the baby's needs and I believe that's that's truth for the for the for the later on later stage in life as well. If if I am able to first of all make or we, we as a parents we're able to make the environment safe and secure and trustworthy, then after that is like okay, what does what does what does he need right now? What are the needs? Okay, you know, food check, diapers check, you know, warmth and you know check, safety and security check. Like so so. That, that was one of the biggest, bigger things. And then um, the another sort of piece of advice that I got from my cousin, actually, he's got uh, two little ones and, and he was just very, very quiet and kind of like, he didn't really give me anything. And so he, he just told me like, okay, you're going to get so much, so much advice and so many things being told to you. Cause I was like, okay, how I'm going to be as a father, how I'm going to be able to handle the little baby like physically as well. And he just told me like, Hey, Tuomo, you know, once the baby comes out, you just know, you just know what to do. Like you don't have to mentalize it or you don't have to start to contextualize or try to think about it, what to do and try to learn it. You just know. And I was just like, huh, okay. I, I didn't really understand what he meant until I embodied the information when our baby came out. And it was like all the doubt and all the fears, they just dissipated down. All of a sudden, I just, I almost like I felt I had that innate capabilities that innate fatherhood that innate father came out to play like mm -hmm. I, I i have i had zero doubts and zero fears i was just like you know i got this i, I know exactly what to do in, in in a grander scheme of things of course i made many mistakes and you know sometimes oh i should have done that i should have done that da, 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 da. but in the end of the day there's like that innate trust to myself as a father mm -hmm. i'm not sure exactly where it came out from but it just it just came out like hey I got this. Like, I, I know exactly what to do. So those kind of like deeper mindset shifts that 
I don't think there's no way that I could have learned those from the books. Um, yet at the same time, the knowledge is great. We need to have the knowledge as well. Like I said, like we're, as we were getting ready for the birth, the knowledge was great. It helped us a lot. But then there's that grander wisdom that we, ha we all have as parents inside of us. And, and more we can tap into that, I think, um, I, I think that's, that's something that we should all as parents, like, hey, you know, I'm a parent, I'm a mother, I'm a father, I got this. Like, and, and I'm seeing that from my partner, how, how she's been now cooked into, in such a hot soup. Um, going through the, the natural birth and becoming becoming a mother all of a sudden is like, and the same for me as well. Like, all of a sudden, the two to three hours of sleep, it's 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 great. It's like, you know, the energy just comes out. You know, and you're not sure where it comes out from, but it just comes out. So you you step into a completely different person and personality of yourself as well. So so yeah, I think that's uh, that's that's the that non book wisdom that I've learned. <laughs> yes. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, absolutely. Gosh, yes, a grander wisdom. Can I quote you on that one day? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, please do. Um, yeah. Um, okay, Anna, do you have any? Um, yes. Um, one of the books that I read before, but I didn't finish it. Eh. Um, I read The No Drama Discipline by Daniel Seagal. It's all about how the child's brain develops. And so that we can discipline our child and making them feel love at the same time. Uh, I get, I get the quote. Um, it's like for for a child or an adult, it's extremely powerful to hear someone say, "I get you. I understand you. I see why you feel this way." And so this kind of empathy disarms us. We don't even really understand what is going on to our children's mind, right? So. How can you say that na, that you are empathizing your child without even understanding what is really happening? And another is the controversial article of Dana Martin. Um, she's the author of uh, she's uh, an unschooling consultant. Um, she says that radical unschooling is not for the lazy parent because we are from homeschooling. We are now. Um, and schooling. So it says that rules and force are easy for a parent, but at what cost to the child and the relationship? Permissive parenting and non involvement is not what we are promoting here either. The radical and schooling life is very involved, connected, and hands on. If you will um, look at the word and schooling, it's, it's a negative. There's a negative connect. Uh, there, there's a negative word per se to the word and schooling. So I'd rather call us life schooling. It's, be it's better than unschooling. And it takes time to find ways to ins ensure the child's rights and freedom are respected while ensuring the child's health and safety. But it can be done and done well. So here, um, we are unschooling because um, I am trusting my child that she will learn on her own without being forced. Um, I'm not, I am a teacher, I am a, a teacher, but um, I'm not the traditional teacher. That's why I resigned from the school because I think I am not aligned with the curriculum of the traditional school. So I just let my child, my daughter learn on her own um, with with her own freedom, with, with her own interest. And um, for me personally, I will. Um, we talk, my husband and I talk about it that um, we will not take any assessment or validation. And my child's um, line, if she is in line with entrepreneurship right now. Um, here in the Philippines, we don't encourage entrepreneurship because we think it's business. But now. Um, we, my, our mindset is going to the entrepreneurship side. Um, we want our children to self-educate. So that's it. Mm -hmm. Instead of, instead of being employed. Okay. All right. So follow their own, their own course. Yeah. Instead of following somebody else's for them. Okay. Very good. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. So Katrina, what? 
Well, so this is not so much a dream book, but it's a life book. It's one of my favorites that I love to tell people about. It's called There Is Nothing Wrong With You. The subtitle is Going Beyond Self-Hate. Hatred, mm -hmm. maybe. I can't remember if it's Going Beyond Self-Hate or Hatred. But it's written by Sherry Huber. And she's a Zen monk. Um, and uh, it's a simple cartoony book. But it's so perfect for how you do this is how you do everything, how you think about, you know, how you look at the world. And it gives very simple examples of how our ego plays stuff out. And you can apply it to children, parents, anybody. That's probably one of my favorite books I recommend to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. That sounds awesome. Yeah. Sounds very useful. Gosh. You know, to, to wrap things up this evening, and, and I would like to, after we stop recording, if we could keep on for a little bit and just wrap things up between ourselves, that would be great. Um, but, you know, I, I picked up a theme, well, a few themes tonight, that it, it's very important as a parent to be calm and to give your children security. And one way to, to give them that security is to have a calm attitude and feel okay within yourself. And to, let's see, you have to heal yourself and um, not let your, your own, um, let's see, not let your own agenda be forced onto your children um, and let the children do, um, do what they need to do to learn, to kind of, you know, you can be their support, you can be their consultant as they learn. Um, and that the opposite of all that is fear that when we, if we walk in fear as parents, that we're not, we're not doing any of these other positive things. So it's better to, to have faith in yourself as a parent and to not kick yourself too hard, but to know that it is a process and it's okay to make mistakes and, and to go on because our children are also going to learn how to deal with their own mistakes by the way that we handle ours. So they can catch our self-esteem by, by how we present ours. So um, let's see. Well, if nobody else has any other closing thoughts, I, I think we'll close. So um, I want to thank everybody watching. And uh, if, let's see, you can look us up on Facebook. Um, and who knows, I suppose. I, know has I wrote in my, uh, on the YouTube channel, all of your names. And if you want to add some stuff, you can add some stuff in the comments there or send me more stuff to add into the actual box where you write stuff. Then I can add stuff like maybe it's a website you have or anything else that you'd like to share. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Thank you for doing that. All right. Well, thank you for joining us and thank you to all of you. And so we'll sign off. Good night. I'm just stopping the recording and I'm going to stop.